Hello, I'm Duncan Law here from Community Energy England. I'm Head of Policy and Advocacy, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this Community Energy Fortnight event on funding applications, how, how what works and what doesn't. Uh, and to welcome Tara Bowers from Exeter Community Energy, Dan Curtis from BESCO, and Nicola Davison from Community Energy South to give us the benefit of their, their experience. Uh, I'd like to thank Kirsty from Bucks Community Energy, who also convenes our Energy Efficiency Working Group for uh, doing amazing work on convening through Community Energy Fortnight and this event. Um, if you would like to introduce yourself with your name and organisation in the chat, that would be helpful for us and possibly for other participants. So I'm going to run through a quick outline of the event and a little bit about CEE and to warn you that the event is being recorded, as you heard, please if, turn off your camera if you don't want to be seen as part of the recording. Uh, and the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel for the benefit of everybody. Um, any questions, please uh, put them in the chat and we will be sorting them for Kirsty to ask our expert panel uh, at the end of the, the presentations in the Q&A session. Um, so I'm not quite sure uh, which order speakers are going to speak in. Kirsty, do you want to tell us or will that just come out in the wash? Let, let it come out in the wash. Great, so um, a quick introduction to, um, to Community Energy England. Uh, sorry, I'm obscuring my screens such that I can't see what I'm doing. Um, yes, uh, Community Energy England was founded in 2014 to be a voice uh, and a connector for the sector um, and to create a network across the country. Uh, our membership is now 275 organisations, including mostly community energy organisations and a number of other uh, stakeholders and corporates who, who want to support the sector. Um, our work is basically to help clear obstacles, create, create connections, share learning uh, between stakeholders and facilitate the work of community energy organisations um, so that the whole sector benefits. Um, we do a lot of work, I do a lot of work uh, on policy, trying to respond to uh, movements uh, and priorities such as our need for uh, increasing energy efficiency work, uh, f facing towards the possibility of onshore wind uh, emerging. Um, we work to make politicians and national and local government officials and networks aware of community energy and the benefits it brings, the needs, the opportunities and obstacles that very often they put in place and try and get them to produce supportive uh, policy and regulations. And I'll bring you a bit of news at the end of today. Um, if you want to find out about more about our policy work, there's a section on our website uh, and you can also see our current consultations, active campaigns and our policy responses uh, and guidance and resources, including on our how to section. Uh, Community Energy Fortnight is amazing. <laughs> uh, and this is part of it. Uh, it. It's a nationwide campaign from the 10th to the 23rd of Ju June. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for you to make your uh, organization's activities visible. So please, uh, if you haven't already in future, uh, volunteer to put on shows, guided tours and so on. Um, it's also a great introduction for people who are new to community energy to get a flavor and to learn what community energy is about. Uh, please visit the uh, CEF page, the Community Energy Fortnight page on our events uh, section on the website and come to more events. Okay, without further ado, I will hand over to Kirsty to take us forward and, and hold this uh, beautiful event. Kirsty. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much to our speakers for joining us and thank you to all of you for attending. So um, I'm not going to talk for long at all. I'm going to introduce our first speaker who is Tara Bowers from Exeter Community Energy. Uh, a veteran of many uh, applications, as are all of our um, 
speakers today. Um, if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat. But if we could avoid some uh, secondary debate and just uh, focus on the presentation, that would be really handy. And then we can have a discussion and debate at the end uh, when the speakers are finished. Um, over to you, Tara. Thanks very much, Kirsty. Um, thanks for inviting me today. So, uh, yeah, so I thought I'd just explain a little bit about who I am, what I do. So I am a director at Exeter Community Energy and I run our energy efficiency project called Healthy Homes for Wellbeing. So that's all around helping vulnerable people in fuel poverty, so low income households and, and vulnerable people. So all of the funds uh, funding applications that I've done is all around that topic. It's all around giving free energy advice in the community. Um, so first of all, I'll talk to you about some unsuccessful bids. If you can change forward to the slide, um, Duncan, for me to the unsuccessful, there we go. So um, we actually haven't had that many unsuccessful ones. So uh, it's quite easy for me to talk to you about these. Um, you can see from this selection that actually quite a few of the, the unsuccessful ones have been quite small amounts. And I thought I'd just actually touch on a couple, even though my brief was to talk to one, talk about one, because it, it's quite interesting for me to see the reasons we were turned down. And the top two, I think, are quite hilarious, really, that um, a couple of councils felt that we wouldn't add value or that our work wasn't COVID related. When, of course, I'm sure most of you know that obviously helping people in fuel poverty and helping with their bills is very much about adding value and helping people in times of crisis. So um, I just think it's always quite amusing to see the reasons why we refused funding. Um, another interesting one recently was the S Smart Energy GB bid, um, where we were told it was a really great application that scored highly, but they felt our risk mitigation was weak. But actually all I did was copied the same risk mitigation text that had been in a successful redress bid in the successful British Gas Energy Trust bid and a successful shared prosperity funding bid. So why Smart Energy GB felt there was something wrong with my risk mitigation when the other three funders didn't, again, is quite amusing. So I think the first thing to say is take what you're given as feedback with a pinch of salt, because I think sometimes it's not always the right reason why you've been turned down. Um, but the one I really wanted to pick on here as a really big tip that I learned was um, uh, we did a redress a uh, partnership bid with a charity in Mid Devon in 2021 called Chat and Chat are a housing charity. We've been working with them with quite for quite some time. They've been making referrals to us for help for for residents, and also we were doing um, a drop in clinic at their venue every month. And we decided we'd like to build our partnership um, more around embedding energy services into their charity. And we were turned down. And the main reason was that we would included match funding with LEAP home visits. And if, and if people don't know what LEAP is, that's Local Energy Advice Partnership, which is a national programme with a local partner for LEAP in Devon. And we'd included that as much funding and um, we hadn't really read the guidelines properly. And Redress felt that that was a conflict of funding that LEAP is funded by um, energy company obligation funding so they felt there was a, a conflict of funding and we and therefore we failed on guidelines so the top tip is make sure you thoroughly read the funding guidelines and if you're at all unsure about um, whether you, what you want to propose meets with the guidelines have a conversation with the funder normally on the funding applications they give you an opportunity to raise questions or to have a discussion and we didn't do that and perhaps in hindsight we should have done but it was just complete sheer ignorance on my part that we thought <laughs> we felt that what we were doing would be fine and it, and it wasn't <clears throat> so that's the biggest tip um, I can give you in in that arena and but moving on to the next slide the good news was we did resubmit the bid we took on board the feedback and um, if you flick forward um, Duncan um, we, we took out the LEAP home visits and added in 60,000 of funding to have redress funded home visits and we were successful. So um, that's the other big tip is take on board what the feedback is and adjust accordingly when you resubmit. Um, next slide um, is our successful bids and I'm going to talk about one of these in particular. So hopefully there's a whole list going to appear. There we go. So these are all our successful bids that we've had in the last few years. <clears throat> and quite a few of them have stories behind them. But the one I'm going to talk to you about in depth is the top one, um, National Grid, as they're now called, was Western Power Distribution, their Energy Affordability Fund. We've just been successful with this for the sixth year running. Uh, so moving forward, I'll explain why I think we've been successful. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, yeah, carry on. 
so yeah so I think um my top tip is why change a winning formula in in 2018 we did our first bid and we were successful it was for quite a small amount of money at that time about six thousand pounds I think but in 2019 we did a bigger bid and we completely changed our bid and the feedback at that time was it was a really amazing proposal so when we rebid in 2020 we felt well if it was really amazing in 2019 do we actually need to write anything different so we practically entered the same bid with just a few minor changes on amounts and perhaps demograph of who we were going to uh, deliver our service to and we were successful and they said it was an amazing bid and so in 2021 we rebid again with exactly the same bid and we were told it was amazing and we got the money and in 2022 we did exactly the same and then I panicked because I had an email saying um, we've been really oversubscribed this year there were 53 applicants and it's going to take us a lot longer to get through the applications but I was pleased to say that we were one of seven that was granted the money. And again, the feedback was it was an amazing bid that scored highly. So guess what? In 2023, I just resubmit the same bid again. And yet again, we were one of seven that got funding in our region. So um, I think that's all I can say on that really is that we found something that we got feedback that said it was amazing. Why, why spend the time and effort rewriting something every year? If it's amazing, it's amazing. It's going to be amazing every year because the funders have a score chart. They're ticking against you know what they're looking for in terms of criteria so if you scored highly once you're going to score highly again so um just keep doing what you do if you've had a successful a successful one is my tip and i think that's me done <clears throat> and i'll pick up questions at the end with everybody else lovely thank you very much tara that's um that's really uh it, very interesting um and thank you for those uh tips along the way um, so our next speaker is Dan Curtis from Brighton and Hove Energy Services Co-op, one of the longest names. So thankfully, we just call it Besco. And um, and over to you, Dan, if you're ready. There you are. You're on mute. Sorry, classic. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I'm. My name is Dan Curtis from. Brighton and Hove Energy Services Cooperative, or BESCO. Uh, I'm the communications officer at BESCO, so I, uh, I look after most of our external communications, the website, social media and stuff, but also I'm typically involved with any funding applications that we have done, of which there are many. Um, they, uh, we've been involved similarly with, uh, as Tara, with thankfully quite a lot of successful applications over the years. Here's just some examples. The, the rural, the Rural Community Energy Fund, or RCEF, as everyone refers to it, we were successful in four separate bids, which was typically uh, to do a decarbonisation of heat study for rural off-gas villages in Sussex. So a very specific uh, thing there. Uh, similarly, I think once, once we were successful in the first bid, we could quite easily replicate what our offering was for the subsequent ones. And we, I think we had a 100% success ratio of applying for those RCEF ones. Uh, the MCS Charitable Foundation, uh, we delivered a project called Retrofit Streets, which was in collaboration with uh, South East London Community Energy and also Carbon Co-ops in Manchester, where each different group uh, were looking to introduce a street level retrofit um, project in, in their town, trying to get uh, uh, bulk procurement and sort of uh, uh, efficiencies from uh, uh, tackling it at a whole street level. Uh, the energy redress scheme uh, we were successful with for uh, delivering free home energy surveys in, in the Brighton and Hove area. That's a two year uh, program. I think we have funding to deliver 160 free home energy surveys or, or something like that. Uh, one that was a bit different, which we, we just only last month were told we were successful with was for the uh, an, an LAEP, a local area energy plan to deliver a local area energy plan for um, a company called The Marchers, who, as you can see, they're, they're responsible for the decarbonisation of Hertfordshire, Shropshire and Telford. So that's not grant funding, but it's, it's kind of similar. Um, uh, and then, of course, the, the big energy saving network is something probably a lot of people have heard about. That's the one I was going to talk about in a, in a little bit more detail. But the, uh, the, the points, I think, why we're successful for the BESN, I think, applied for all the others. I think... As Tara alluded to, I think one of the most important things in writing a successful application is making sure that you are meeting the requirements or the expectations of the funder. Um, so what I typically do whenever we 
look through the, the application guidelines is they almost always have a series of uh, bullet points saying this is what we expect you to deliver in these time frames, etc. I'll always go through that and break those all down and I answer each bullet point with a separate separately so I can just really focus on that one particular thing that the funders want to make sure I'm trying to really keep focused on that and not getting distracted by the things that perhaps I want to do or that we think would be great to do but aren't necessarily actually what the funder wants you to deliver. Um, and then we would always review, so I typically draft the answers first and then we review that as a team and um, so obviously sometimes uh, word counts can be a bit of a challenge with things like that but uh, so with something like the Big Energy Saving Network that is an annual fund and probably quite a lot of people that have done that delivered that in the past are applying again I think it's always useful to to lay out clearly how you're going to deliver what the funders want what your plan will be um, and to to explain or to demonstrate how you have an experience of doing this in the past uh, and uh, the partnerships that you've built in the past and the learnings that you've taken and how you're going to apply those things to make a to guarantee you know a successful application this time around of course that doesn't always work um, uh, an example of a, a failed application we had recently was for something called a to be part of a, a LEAD, a local energy advice demonstrator, which was, I think it's a, it's a national government funded program, but this particular tranche for us was, we were applying to the Greater Southeast Energy Hub. And Tara mentioned just before about how it can be valuable to maybe speak with the funder to clarify exactly that what you're proposing is what they want. And in BESCO's case, that's where it wasn't quite matched up in this example. So what the funders were looking for was for you, you know, for the for the applicant to deliver energy advice, particularly around energy efficiency in, in your local area and how, how you could engage local residents with making improvements to the energy efficiency of their property. Our proposal was to kind of, we, we were going to do that on a community level at a, a local village near Brighton. And in addition to visiting homes to uh, get an understanding of what uh, the common challenges and common solutions would be, we were going to design a package uh, of energy efficiency improvements, a phased uh, package, so you know, low hanging fruit first and then onto more complicated measures. And to try, our proposal was to then try and engage uh, some local installers with say 100 properties that wanted loft insulation or uh, um, double glazed windows or something to try and get um, a better price on behalf of the properties uh, and also we would take care of the project management so organizing the, the visits and to kind of project manage the whole thing the feedback from the funder was that they really wanted this just to be about advice they thought they said that our approach was too hands-on too pragmatic really um, which was very disappointing to be told that you know, we, 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 they wanted more talk, less action really was kind of what I took away from that. But we expended quite a lot of time and effort on, on this bid. And it's very disappointing to, to be, as I say, we, it, we probably should have called them in hindsight earlier on to briefly describe our suggestions and to see if that really was what they were looking for. It turns out that it wasn't. However, they, they did, Greater Southeast Energy Hub were quite enthusiastic about our suggestions our idea and they were hoping to find a different avenue to provide funding for that in the near future. Um, so what lessons have I taken away from both successful and unsuccessful ones? Um, the, 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 the top one there is exactly what Tyra said, to be, to be sure, be very sure that what you're proposing is exactly what the funder wants, otherwise you're wasting everybody's time. So I think it's worth taking the time to, to carefully read through exactly what they're looking for and list that down and see if, if that aligns with your project. Again, Tara talked about the importance of a risk assessment or a risk mitigation strategy. Um, we often include a, a series of a, a appendices with, with our funding applications, typically things like a Gantt chart to explain the different keystones, the different milestones of your project from project launch to you know, phase one, uh, when you're going to report on things, when you're going to engage with uh, the consumers or feedback to the funders. I think it's always it just looks quite professional I think to include something like that uh, and I always try and make use of any publicly available data wherever we can uh, to demonstrate that you are going to target the 
uh, demographics that, that, that the funder is looking for. So let's say so if, if that's for a fuel poverty project, you can quite easily find um, um, indices of uh, is it more areas of deprivation, or if you're looking to for funding for an energy efficiency project, you can find EPC data, or perhaps for decarbonisation of heating, you can look at the non-gas map. I had a, I, uh, yeah, here's an example of some of those um, that just, just, just publicly available data sources. Um, the non-gas map is particularly, I think, particularly useful because it has uh, fuel poverty details on there. It has uh, the, the, the number, the different types of property, different tenure. It has whether houses are homeowner, privately rented council housing. It has a breakdown of the EPCs as well. It's a really excellent source. I, I, I assumed that the presentations would be shared around. So I have links to a couple of those at the end, uh, which hopefully will be useful to people. Um, but happy to answer any questions afterwards. That's, that's, that's all for me uh, at the moment. I'll hand back. Uh, to Kirsty. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Dan. And actually, that's really interesting um, in terms of the level of extra detail that you go into. Um, and it seems like the, the the bigger the funder and the bigger the amount, the more of that kind of homework you have to do. And, and it wouldn't occur to most of us to do that probably if we're first timers. So that's a really useful insight. Um, thank you. So um, over now to our final speaker, um, Nicola Davidson from Community Energy South a veteran and a professional fundraiser. And so, um, you know, really, really happy to have you here and um, over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Dan and Tara, for those brilliant presentations. Um, I thoroughly agree with all of the tips and advice you've given. Right, I'll share my screen. Is that coming up nicely? Brilliant, okay. Um, just a bit of introduction from me. Um, my job is a project manager at Community Energy South. So I nurture the growth of new community energy groups, helping them become incorporated, develop business plans, pipeline projects, and, and fundraising directly for them. Also did a bit of fundraising for the organization our, our, ourselves, Community Energy South. But in my spare time, I'm also on the board of directors for Made Energy, which is a community benefit society in Berkshire and East Surrey. So we've done a lot of fundraising for, for our projects as well. I've also got um, a fundraising background. It was my, my day job for 10 years. And I just click on. Where is it? There it is. And I used to be a professional fundraiser. I still am. So nine months completing a diploma, um, 10 years earning an income from fundraising, uh, specifically in trusts, foundations, government funding and share offer raising. And I put that there because I've had loads of failures. So even professionals have failures. So please don't feel um, uh, uninspired or demotivated when you get knocked back because it happens to all of us. And just 23% of funding applications nationally are successful. Um, so do bear that in mind. Writing bids takes me ages and I'm gonna take you on to my biggest failure, which is horrific, which is the energy redress fund. I have failed twice on this, so still not got any money for a project, which I think is amazing. First of all, we submitted one in partnership with the Surrey Muslim Association. There you've got 24,000 um, Muslims, fantastic community, went to visit um, the largest mosque in Surrey, met 10 imams. They said, we want this project, help us do it. I designed it, it was gonna be delivered by them. Fantastic, really strong fit with the project criteria, addressed everything and had the innovation. So that was a 400K project over two years, 5,000 interventions delivered by the community themselves who would be fully trained up. Feedback came back. Um, yeah, it was great. Um, Oversubscribe. So I tried again. I reduced the size of the project by 50%, secured 30% upfront funding in cash from a local philanthropist. We were shortlisted, scored very highly, but no. Lessons learned here. I don't think they actually wanted innovation or ambition in that fund. I think they just wanted to get as many people as possible to benefit. So lots more interventions at a lower cost per intervention. So higher beneficiary numbers. Um, I also think it's possible that the geography could have played 
part in it because funders they will want to spread their funding awards well across the UK so perhaps there are better bigger things going on in Surrey um, the applicant organization was um, wasn't the Surrey Muslim Association we used another charity who were very engaging and they were going to work in partnership they were going to be the ones to receive the, 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 the funding and I think it's possible that the turnover of that organization organization was sort of similar to the amount we were looking for. So I think generally they like to find bigger organizations who have that scope to sort out the contingency if anything goes wrong. Whereas this one, it was pretty close to the wire. I also think organizations like Energy Redress, Energy Trust, Energy Savings Trust, they like to fund organizations they're familiar with. So perhaps we should have partnered with one or two of them, such as Citizens Advice, who have been really successful. One I have been really successful with, with is local authority funding. I, through the Community Energy South work, supported one of the new groups in Essex, Saffron Walden Community Energy. There we secured some funds for a project which the local district authority found a was a perfect fit for what they were looking for. Lessons learned there, meet the funder face-to-face -face where possible. Clearly that's not possible with a funder like the Energy Redress Fund, but local funds like this, they're very keen to work through and help grow the project if possible. And we did just that. We explored how the project could meet goals that they were dealing with beyond the fund criteria. So looking at their wider strategy, further goals that might be down the line and show how the project can meet more than the criteria, such as offering councillors photo opportunities to, and, and opinion, chances for them to, to share information that's going on throughout the project for communities to, to join together, and staff volunteering, for example. One of the things I did in here was to calculate the financial value of all the in-kind work that would be part of that project. And I've put a value to that according to national lottery um, uh, criteria calculations. And I added that in and explained it as match funding. They quite liked that. One of the things I always do is think about the form as an exam paper. So score highly in every section. And Dan mentioned something like this, where you break it down into bullet points and answer those to make sure you're scoring properly in each of them. And if your eligibility is weak, you think my project is great, got to go for this fund, partner with someone else who is strong. And that was one of the things I learned in the redress fund. So I am going to spend more of my time on this sort of funder than funders that are further away that I can't reach and build a relationship with. And other tips, start developing the project as early as you possibly can to leave your project time to brew so that you can come up with more ideas as your, as your daily work goes on. You get more chances to, to give it with a co um, colleague, send it to a colleague, get their input, and then perhaps go off and do some research on that new thing so that you can build it up. Add evidence to justify your answers. Yep, totally agree with what Dan said about finding evidence, really research what you're doing. But I would say beware that you don't get pulled into putting the, the evidence into appendices rather than alluding to them in the body of the text as well. But yeah, totally agree with, with, with Dan. And lastly, collaborate wherever you possibly can. Funders love collaborations. I've heard that directly from them. So if you've got a fantastic project idea and it's to do with your community, why don't you put it on the Lumio chat? Or with Community Energy England, see who else is doing something similar at the other end of the country and see if you can create a sort of two-phase project. Obviously that won't work if it's not a national funder, but national funders might really like that. Thank you. Stop sharing. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That was really, really great. And thank you to all three of you. Uh, and I think there's some very common themes for success coming out. Um, so now I'm going to um, so I'm going to put the questions to our speakers first, but um, if they uh, don't necessarily have the answers, then I might put it out to the room. We'll just see if that if chaos ensues or not. <laughs> um, but we've had some good questions in the chat, so I'm just going to go through these. 
so you guys are going to have to think on your feet, but hopefully it's second nature to you, the stuff of nightmares or of dreams, we don't know. So um, there's a question from um, Ellen Hill. I'm not sure whether uh, what, what this particular thing is, so I'm just going to put it to you and hopefully you will know. Um, she asks, are there any grants available for energy local clubs that anybody's aware of? I'd suggest um, Energy Local is a very innovative response. So look for funders who want innovation and um, community engagement. Mm. OK. And I think and what Nicola said just now as well is, you know, maybe put a, a shout out to see if anyone in a different part of the country is doing something, because then you can, you know, copy what they're doing in terms of the type of funder they've managed to be successful with. And what kind of funds do you think are looking for innovation like that from your experience? I would say that um, local authorities who have climate, um, climate focused funds might find that sort of project really interesting. Um, if they don't publicize it, get in contact with them and say and, and ask if they've got a little bit of um, cash, you know, five, 5k to get get trained up and to, to design something. I mean, energy local projects can collaborate with commercial um, renewable projects or community owned ones as well so there's lots of opportunity around that. I was just going to say there's the, the, the government have an a online contract portal that you can search on with whatever keywords you want to, to try to find um, yeah I mean, if you put in energy for example I think there's about 500 uh, options come up but you, you can kind of be more specific by by region or put in energy local for example things like that so i, I suggest try, trying to find or have a go on that is that is that a grant funding one dan that's a grant funding um, one. there are it's a mixture of different different types of contracts and information um in, in invitation to tenders and things like that but there are i think some grants on there yeah thank you okay so um are there any funds to help village halls redo wiring ahead of applying for solar and other potential building remediations? I, I'm guessing this is sort of like the Platinum Jubilee Village Hall Fund, that kind of thing. Are there any others that you're aware of? Screwfix Foundation. Oh, that's an interesting one. And I, th I think sometimes a few of those kind of DIY type companies have funds, not necessarily all year round, but it's worth checking them to see what they've got available. And sometimes they're really quite small pops, but you might be able to match that with maybe local authority funding, like local council funding, something. I know definitely in Devon, we've got a few pots from local councils around supporting village halls. I'd also add that if it was my village hall, what I would do is put out a call to the community to see if you can get any SMEs who have those skills to offer a half a day and create an event where you're bringing um, companies together on the basis that they can use that as a high profile opportunity to show how green they are and get them hooked into your, your project. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you. Um, and Dave, Powis has asked, oh wait, hang on, sorry. No, no, I'm gonna get ahead of myself. We, so Chris Blumley has asked, uh, do we have exemplar funding applications? And I can actually answer that one because we do have some in the energy efficiency working group. We've created a form where uh, actually Nicola, you've, you've submitted one. I think Tara, you've done some as well. Um, so um, I suggest Chris that you get in touch with um, What's the best? Duncan, probably. Uh, Duncan, would you mind putting your email address in the chat? Um, because we can share those with you. The, these guys have very uh, kindly uh, redacted them and anonymized them to give you an idea. Um, would you, what would you say in terms of, of how best to use exemplar funding applications? Uh, any of our speakers sorry well, it depends it depends on the funder and the application I think what we were all saying is obviously you need to make sure that you match your your bid according to the funders guidelines and their requirements so you know that hopefully the examples that we've given just give some key indicators in terms of perhaps the quality of the writing and the depth of the writing and the examples we give perhaps is is, is the best way that they show you know, a successful application, but you know, you, you can't just 
take it and use it you need to really be careful you know do what dan says is break down your application point by point and are you are you meeting all the questions that the fund is asking you but they're, they're just a good perhaps good example just to read you know the kind of the the strength of the writing perhaps mm. or even I... structure perhaps things like that sorry yeah, yeah. go on dan yeah, sorry I... that's what i was going to say i was going i was going to add have a look at the national lottery awards for all um, funding application page because they give some typical questions and I think they are very focused on community engagement encouraging projects to be led by community rather than projects designed and, and given to the community so those sort of questions on the answer form give you a little bit more depth about what might be an ideal uh, response okay, thank you um, how how do you manage the unspent funds I never have any. <laughs> I think if you have unspent funds, go back to the funder and say and ask if you can spend it on a project extension or something similar in your community that meets similar needs. Yeah, I think generally they don't want them back, do they? So they'd rather they'd rather hear from you how you want to repurpose it than um, than have it back and have to do the administration around that. And you're also going to weaken your position next time you want to bid to them if you're going to tell them that you've un unspent. You haven't basically delivered what you said you were going to. So I'd be wary of that. Mm. Yeah, just yeah. Buy more. And I was going to say, yeah, and I, I've in the past I've done that where, you know, maybe where we had two different activities under a project and one was doing much, much better than the other, then, yeah, we, we would perhaps request that we could change some of the targets and spend more money in a key target area that was going very well. Mm or buy more paper clips. <laughs> so, uh, and Dave has asked what's in-kind work. It's usually volunteering, isn't it? Basically, it's voluntary time from, from your teams. Is that what, how you would do in-kind? Yes, I would. It's expertise that you can bring in, whether it's expert expertise in terms of a specialism, um, whether it's people giving their time on, on, on an ordinary sort of voluntary basis, giving it energy advice, all sorts of things you can come up with as, um, as in kind. Be creative. And how do you cost that up then? You recommended the lottery has a has, has a kind of costing thing for that, does it? Yeah, usually there's skilled or unskilled. So decide whether your in kind contribution from people is a skill, um, highly skilled or not. Something like eleven pound an hour for unskilled. Twenty-two pound an hour for, for skilled, but you can just Google it. It's there's quite a bit of information on that. And presumably, if it's if it's something very specialist, like a solar engineer giving their time, you could cost it at whatever you is the going rate in the in the industry. If you had to put that out to a consultancy, exactly. And don't forget VAT. If they're going to charge, if they would ordinarily charge VAT, there's that. That's a consideration as well. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Um, so Neil uh, Linlithgow from Community Development Trust, Linlithgow Solar, um, how he's asking, how have you managed to get core funding for uh, key staff, including fundraising staff? How, how have you managed to do that? Uh, I just build a bit into each bid, to be honest, make sure I've got overheads covered, um, maybe just um, ensure that I'm being generous with my costings to ensure that we've got enough money to cover everything we need to cover um so then you can you can use use your kind of surpluses and in inverted commas to then pay for your key staff like a funder dan nicola do you have anything to add on that yeah i, I would totally agree with, with tara you've got know your overhead costs and allocate them out to the project on a daily basis I don't really deal with the budget creation, so <laughs> I don't want to get involved with that. Sorry. Okay. And and are there there are also more and more funds who will pay for running costs such as staffing, aren't there? It used to be they would only pay for the the I don't know the beneficiary element, but there are they are understanding now that you need running costs, aren't they? So that's a bit easier. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah. But what is one of the recent ones that BESCO applied for, we, we had to submit a CV for all of the, the key staff that were going to be involved, what their hourly rate was and how many hours we expected them to contribute to the project. So there was over the course of 
12 months or something, which says, yeah, very highly specialized calculation there, which thankfully I wasn't involved in, but I did see it as part of the bid submission. Um, but yeah, in that particular case, they were totally happy basically yeah, to, to pay for the staff time for the duration of that project, as long as you could evidence the need for it. And you could set your own rate to it as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so there's a question here, Dave, I think we might, you might want to um, attend the energy efficiency working group to ask this question because you'll find exactly the right people um, there. He's asking whether there's any advice on first steps for a community energy organization who's done several solar PV and LED projects and is thinking about starting to deliver energy advice to um, homeowners. Um, I think um, that's this is probably not the right workshop for that, um, but uh, I'm sure that any um, any of our energy efficiency working group people would love to um, would be happy to advise. But um, if you email Duncan, we can invite you to that working group, Dave. Um, and then um, Alban Thurston has asked. Uh, are any funders who are providing development or assessment grants willing to under so are they providing development or assessment grants? Oh, so it's sort of like feasibility or development projects that might not res result in the capital funding of the equipment. Um, yeah, so that's the old RSEF, which we all mourn the loss of because that mm. was so helpful. Has, has anything replaced it that's, that's easy to access? We have found in um, in our contracts with Hampshire County Council and a couple of others that they have set up a revolving fund for groups to use at the beginning. Um, but I think what happens is it gets turned into share capital later on. So you're sort of sweating that equity at the start. So that is something. So if you're struggling with that, talk to the local authority and explain how you need that upfront as an enabler to deliver the project, which will reflect so well on their net zero targets if it happens. So it's in their interest to give you some cash. <laughs> mm. But uh, I've also got another uh, an answer to the previous question, which was about um, moving a group from energy generation projects to energy saving. A quick one, we've just done that at Made Energy because we were only about the generation. A couple of our directors were really interested in the energy advice. So we, we got a couple of small grants, two grand, five grand, that sort of thing, just to get going. And then hopefully later on, once our energy generation projects become more profitable, we'll have more income to sustain that as well. So try and get started off with a couple of small grants just to get going. But yeah, if you've already got a solar, if you've already got a community benefit fund, use that. You know, don't necessarily give it to other organisations to spend if you think you can spend it more and with more focus on energy. Because a lot of it, a lot of community energy groups do want to spend it on energy and there aren't enough projects in the community to actually give the grants to. So do it yourselves, basically. It's a good idea, isn't it? Is. And in starting out, once you've got a little bit of money, just a couple of thousand pounds to start something off, you gather evidence, which is then compelling when you talk to stakeholders like your local authority, who might have the budget to give you a bit extra. Brilliant. Um, so uh, Duncan has put in a question. Um, the Energy Redress Fund uh, needs three months funding in your bank account already. And uh, long-term financial viability that basically pays you in arrears how have you overcome that well we tried to overcome it because I got 30 grand from a philanthropist on that very basis but it still wasn't enough so I would absolutely you have to have that money up front <laughs> very difficult to find it so yeah. energy sorry go on Dan the, the, the energy redress fund that BESCO was successful in applying for was in partnership with Brighton Hope Citizens Advice who have vast amount of resource so there we go so i had the yeah. benefit of yeah. partnering with a, a, a big co-provider that's exactly what i was going to say go into partnership with someone else <laughs> who has the money already okay lovely <clears throat> um and phil ferno asks um do you think an all-encompassing application for the whole retrofit education community engagement infrastructure piece is better or separate separate out each project for application depends Tarrant. exactly what the fund is looking for yeah it's also mm. say, yeah yeah well Tarrant, and tara do you have a because you've just started doing more retrofit haven't you and have you found <coughs> that you've still got to do them all separately 
Um, well, no, actually, because we, as Devon, we were successful on the lead funding that Dan, unfortunately, was unsuccessful with. So, yeah, that, so that was an all-encompassing bid around doing, um, you know, the the advice and the education and the community engagement. Um, but, but the actual retrofit action then is paid for by the consumers. So um, the funding enables us to get out into the community and talk up retrofit to a point where then people are willing to start paying for you know the assessments and the works and so forth so so yeah but as Nicholas said it does depend it does depend on what the funder's looking for I mean you know if, if you've got several different funders looking for different things you could perhaps do two or three applications and piece it all together um but if not yeah you know looking for one one big fund that enables you to do a large project is, is also you know equally acceptable yeah and and actually um a lot of a lot of you guys have become self self-sustaining in a way so you want really you want the grant funding to be the seed funding which then helps you create a sustainable business which is uh, you know not for profit social enterprise but but doesn't mean you have to keep begging for money but actually can sustain itself and ideally makes enough that you can then help people for free on the side is that would you say that's generally the aim as well for, for all of your all three of your organizations? Yeah, of course. I mean, you, you certainly it would be a bit a uh, vulnerable business that relied entirely on grant funding for your for your long term future. So, of course, the idea is to get as exactly as you say, to, to, to gain the experience with the grant funding and establish the service that you, that you can then scale up and, and kind of start charging for and, and build out to be well, profit, not profit, you know, enough to cover your running costs. Mm. Yeah. yeah yeah i mean and we i mean we all started somewhere we all started small um you know and it's kind of you, you've got, got i guess you need to think about your long-term strategy if you're just starting out as nicola said you know start off with a small a few small funds and then you know have a have a game plan as to where you want to get to in five or ten years time and try to work out your, you know your steps to get there and what are the activities you need to do along the way and and, and then build that plan. Great. I was just thinking when you were saying about yeah starting small. Sometimes it's, it can be useful to have to have those smaller projects under your belt that you can then use as evidence when in the future applying for a larger pot of money to kind of demonstrate that you have a proven track record of successful delivery and now you want to do it again but on a larger scale or with a larger number of properties or something like that. So yeah, start mm -hmm. small and do it well. Perhaps as a, a some good advice for anyone who's just beginning that journey yeah and um phil actually follows up with um he's they're fundraising for a community engagement worker so is funding for people harder than funding for infrastructure projects or is it it is mm. yeah i think you need to build that cost into projects that deliver the outcomes that the fund is looking for mm. so yeah, focus on concrete outcomes yeah, to, to bid, bid for a project where you're actually delivering that engagement, but that bid will be the cost that you need to pay for that person. Okay. Um, and Michaela from Unity says that they will be opening the next round of Powering Communities, of the Powering Communities Fund soon. So, um, and she's put the link in the chat. So everybody make sure you follow that one. And I guess I have a, a question, which is, um, one of the things that has become really apparent in the working group is that what is absolutely key to successful applications is time and the people to focus on it. And a lot of smaller groups, I suppose there's some confidence and some skills and expertise, but actually the, would you say that the tipping point for you was finding somebody or, or finding the time to do these things, or is there some other magic ingredient that has enabled you to, to grow exponentially? So if I start with you, Tara, and then I'll do Nicola and Dan. <clears throat> um, quite interesting, actually, because I gave a talk on exactly this point on Friday to National Grid. <laughs> so what was our tipping point? And I think we had a couple. I'd, I think having someone focus on funding applications has definitely helped. I don't think that was our tipping point. I think, I think our tipping point was more around um, winning awards that like put us in the spotlight. And I think also that kind of combination of 
COVID and um, the needs that came out of COVID and us being ready to respond, I think was more of our tipping point. Um, it, certainly, it certainly helps having now a funding person because it means I don't have to do it anymore. Somebody else does it. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily think it was our major tipping point. Okay, Nicola? Yeah, I think Tara's spot on with the responses there, um, winning small awards, getting some bits of publicity as well, and being able to promote small successes to start with. Once you've got those, you're going to be able to attract more people to volunteer with you as well. I would say if you're going to try and attract people to your group to do some fundraising, don't call it fundraising, call it communications. You want, you want people in your group who are good at the admin and good at writing and good at listening. So it's not less, those are the skills around fundraising, but you don't have to necessarily put the fundraising label on it. Do it together, don't put it all on one person. Okay, thanks. Dan? Um, yeah, Nicola just mentioned something that I meant to mention before, where uh, the value of having a volunteer who, who can dedicate their hopefully expertise and time towards researching and, and all researching new applications and also helping with the bid writing. Uh, BESCO used to have a, a, an older volunteer who was retired but had decades of experience in, in, in applications and fundraising. She had to withdraw due to health considerations, but the, the, the value that she injected into BESCO for the time she was with us was phenomenal. And I think um, maybe that's the kind of thing that, that any group could, could, could advertise for, perhaps in a, in, a, in a newsletter or something like that. Maybe as Nicholas says, don't call it fundraising, but have to call it yeah, communications or whatever. But uh, uh, I think it's to try and get get value out of your networks because I'm sure every group has has supporters that, that want to get more involved and want to lend their expertise to help. And perhaps you know there's there's a golden application right within your network that's waiting to, to to sort of waiting to be asked. Perhaps so. Um, best go, we, we we really should ask again within our network see if anyone else can help with that. Uh, and just with regards to a tipping point, I would say the thing that BESCO have always tried to achieve is to um, have enough regular income from our larger projects, typically from the sale of solar electricity, as an example, that can then <clears throat> that can then fund our day-to-day -day activities. I know we're very, very, very close to that. That would be the tipping point, is that we then you'd have that kind of 20-year guaranteed income, guaranteed, obviously it depends on solar generation from day to day, but fairly confident forecast of your your um, business costs and um, <clears throat> income stream so that you can then uh, spend more time on, on other things and growing the business once that once that uh, uh, the base level is taken care of so you don't have to worry so much from month to month about kind of staying afloat that, that that's a tipping point that we've been striving towards that from what I understand we're close to achieving but it's sets the dream isn't it <laughs> thank you um, and I think the, we'll go with the one last question before we uh, wrap up, um, which is, is it worth employing a professional fundraiser? And if so, do they work on commission or um, yeah, yeah, how does that normally work or a, a salary? I think if you can afford one, then definitely employ someone. Usually they would, I think, work on a success basis. So you pay how I used to work when I was a professional, you, you pay, the fee is split. There's a base fee, you pay that on, on submission of a bid, and if it's successful, they get the rest of the fee, so, so to speak, and that's a really motivating factor. Yeah. Yeah, any other views on that? It's not something we've ever considered, I don't think. I don't, I don't have no. anything to say about that, sorry. No. Yeah, we, we considered it, but um, we didn't find anybody in our area um, that we could afford, probably, <laughs> at the time. Um, but yeah, we ended up just doing it in house. So we found we found somebody that was had lots of funding experience, but was interested in getting involved in energy, and actually joined us to be a home energy advisor. And I refused to let her be an energy advisor, and told her she could join us to be a funder instead. <laughs> Well, one idea, one idea I've just had is in your collaboration with organisations that might be bigger than you, try and find one that's got a fundraiser so they can write the bid for you on behalf of both yeah. organisations. There you go. What a point Genius. to end up. <laughs> Genius. Genius. Excellent. Well, thank you three very, very much for your um, presentations and for answering all the questions. And thank you to all the participants and, and for the great questions. Um, it's been really, really illuminating and interesting. So um, 
this will be recorded so people can watch it back and share it. Um, and, you know, don't hesitate to get in touch with Community Energy England um, for if you need any follow up in terms of the participants, you know, we are there, well, you, Community Energy England is there to help and advise and mentor. And uh, so do use the resources that we've got. Um, so it just remains to say thank you very, very much and happy Community Energy Fortnight. Oh, Duncan is raising a hand. Oh, oh, you were going to, yes, Duncan has something very, some very good, well, hopefully good news that he just wants to share with everyone. Go for it. Unmuting is always a problem. Uh, yes, just brace, briefly, in case there's anybody here who isn't a member of Community Energy England, we would encourage you to join. There are all sorts of benefits which are listed here. Um, members newsletter with funding advice, a funding page on our website, which you actually can visit anyway, but uh, um, you can have your organization featured as a supporter on the website, the map, um, and you can promote yourself through our newsletters, your events uh, through our mm -hmm. website and the media channels. Uh, you can vote at our AGM and even stand as a director. You get, and this is really valuable, exclusive access to the practitioner forum where knowledge like this is shared on a daily basis, really hot ticket stuff, uh, and the opportunity to feed into our consultation responses and shape what I do daily on behalf of the sector. Um, and you could get an award for all that. So that's the nuts and bolts. And my last piece of news, which you may have seen, um, if not, there's a piece on the news section of our website. Um, the Labour Party yesterday and this morning have announced a local power plan um, and, and their national uh, GB Energy uh, company, which will put 600 million a year up to uh, into local authority funding for uh, local projects, putting solar on uh, local authority land and uh, uh, council estates and everything that you guys all do. And up to 400 million of uh, loans, including contingent loans uh, and some grants into community energy projects, 400 million a year. So funding might just suddenly become a bit di different. They will be uh, low interest loans in the most cases, although there will be, uh, we hope, some some capacity building grants. That means that as you, you will have to be building the repayment, the early repayment of that development loan into your financial, um, uh, into your investment plan. But I thought I'd bring you some good news uh, at the end of a funding workshop. Thank you all for attending and uh, hope to see you, if any of you aren't, as members soon. And thanks to the speakers. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks ever so much. Bye. 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 See you guys.